Welcome everybody. My name is Betsy Conroy and I am the chair of the Women in Bixie group. This is a social group created especially for women in the ICT industry. If you're not already part of our official Women in Bixie group on LinkedIn, I encourage you to uh, join our group. Uh, we have Women in Bixie webinars throughout the year. We have a more than words column in every issue of the Bixie Insider. And we have events such as our Women in Bixie Breakfast at the upcoming 2023 Bixie Winter Conference. If you want to participate um, through funding, you can contribute to the Bixie Cares Professional Development and Scholarship Fund. This is a year-round fundraising effort that is designed to support and promote the ICT community in a variety of ways, including supporting a Women in Bixie candidate for the Bixie Cabling Skills Challenge. The Bixie Cares Women in Bixie Cabling Skills Challenge grant that is funded through the Bixie Cares Professional Development and Scholarship Fund provides financial support to a female competitor who has been accepted to compete at the 2023 Bixie Winter Conference. We are now uh, accepting applications, so please, if you know of someone or you are interested in competing, um, you can submit your application at the web link on the screen. And uh, please note that to be considered, you also need to submit a Bixie Cabling Skills Challenge application and be accepted to compete. Please join me in welcoming our speaker today, Carrie Getz, RCDD, Principal and CTO of Strategic Com. Carrie has over 40 years of global experience designing, running, and auditing data centers, IT departments, and intelligent buildings. She is an international keynote speaker and holds an honorary doctorate in mission critical operations and several industry credentials and certifications. Carrie served on the WIMCO National Education Committee and is a longtime participant in the 724 Exchange, AFCON, and Data Center Institute Board of Advisors, Mission Critical Advisory Board, Women in Data Centers, CNET Technical Curriculum Advisory Board, and the NEDAS Advisory Board. She is also the current Vice Chair of Women in Bixie. Carrie works to champion STEM education through outreach projects in her podcast series and was recently named in the top 25 women in Mission Critical. She was also named one of the top 30 most influential women in tech in 2021 by CIO Outlook and the top 10 most influential women in technology in 2020 by Analytics Insight, among several other accolades. Please join me in welcoming Carrie today as our Women in Bixie speaker. Thanks, Bets. Hi, everybody. I look forward to talking to you today about building your career as a woman in ICT. Um, I hope you get some good pointers out of this. Here's my contact information. I encourage all of you, if you need a mentor, somebody to bounce ideas off of, or you just want to be included in a really fantastic women's network, reach out to me and I'll make sure you get those introductions. So, uh, today, we're going to talk about a few things. Uh, we're going to talk about degrees, job opportunities, networking, ATS machines or applicant tracking systems with some good resume tips, and then some resources and other things that you can use moving forward. So um, I will say this. If we go back to this last screen, this hire the person, not the paper, that's a hashtag that follows the podcast or one of the podcasts that we do. And the idea here is that we know there's a lot of women that are shy of a degree. And to put this in perspective, 31% of the adult population in the United States right now has a four-year or better degree. So that includes um, all the folks with upper level degrees, which is about 14%. That includes doctors, nurses, lawyers. But look at all the open position. There's over, there's millions of open positions in tech right now in all ranges of tech. And companies are getting away from requiring a degree as the first thing, unless it's something like a professional or engineer or something when it's when it's actually required. So as you're going through jobs and you're looking to fill out things in job applicant tracking systems or whatever, keep in mind that most companies will waive that degree requirement for the right candidate. So the trick is not to highlight that you don't have a degree. It's not to highlight that you're, you're shy of the degree, 
but rather you want to make sure that you can match skills that you have to the position um, at stake to make sure that it's all going to work out okay for you. But don't let that hold you up. Men will apply to a job if they feel like they're about 60% qualified. Women typically only apply for a job if they feel like they're 100% qualified. So we're kind of shooting ourselves in the foot uh, by really adhering to that. If it is a hardcore requirement, they'll let you know. They'll pass you, know, pass you by. But I will say that you can't fill every job with 31% of the population. And keep in mind, a lot of those people are already retired. So there's that. So don't, don't sell yourself short. Uh, MOOCs are a great way to advance what you do. These are massive open online classes, and they are exactly the same curriculum you would get in college. The difference is that you're not paying college tuition. You're also not getting credit for the course, but you are getting the benefit of the knowledge of the course, and you can absolutely list these on your job application. There's not an in-class requirement for a lot of these, so you can take them at your own pace, at your own time, and they just help build your knowledge. So if you want to kind of dabble in a different degree or dabble in a different profession or, you know, one of the professions that are outside of what you do now, this is a great way just to kind of get exposure and see if you're really going to like it. Certifications are another really good way. I've had like 40 over the years when I was consulting, that was kind of the deal, you know, you had to have this certification. So, of course, they encouraged us to get a lot of them. A lot of those certifications, the companies don't even exist anymore, but it does help build your knowledge. And so as you get these certifications, whether they're a general industry-wide certification or a particular manufacturer certification, all of these help build your skill set in a non-college setting, and they are all 100% applicable. As a matter of fact, a lot of companies that hire somebody with a degree outside of the industry immediately turn them around and send them for certifications within the industry so that their skills now become, you know, industry leading or, or part of the industry. So don't sell certifications short. If you can get one, there's scholarships for quite a few of these, definitely worth looking into. Networking, I cannot stress this enough. You are nothing without your network. Let me say that again. You are nothing without your network. Not to say that you're nothing, but I'm just telling you all the way through life, all the way through your career and everything that you do, your network are the people that are going to lift you up when you're down. They're going to be your sponsors. They're going to be the ones that bring your name up at the table, let you know where job openings are. So definitely be open to helping others. You know, it's like any other relationship. You're going to get out of what you put into it. So make sure that you are a participant, right, and that you're bringing value to that networking relationship. But definitely consider um, Networking is a, is a huge career strategy, whether it's women in Bixi or some of the other organizations. Then also look at mentors and sponsors. You're going to have multiple mentors through your career. Some of those may be formal mentorships. Some of them may be very informal mentor, mentorships. Uh, and some of them could be even through women in Bixi, you know, the, the mentoring program here, which is has a, a pretty good fixed guideline. So if you're going into mentorship and you have no idea how this relationship should work, there is definitely kind of a roadmap at the women in Bixie one or the Bixie one. But again, you know, with any type of mentorship, it is really important that you put in exactly what you want to get out. So don't expect your mentor to be a mind reader. Don't expect them to intuitively just know what you want or know what you need. And you don't have to know that granularly either. You know, your statement or your goal statement might be that you want to progress into a supervisory or management role and then you work with a manager to help figure out what skills you need to make that happen soft skills and hard skills um, it might be that you want to move into a different portion of the industry and so you pick out some folks shadow them for a day or figure out different things you can do all of those are very important the difference between a mentor and a sponsor, mentors will help you on your own path. Sponsors are the ones that are really going to bring your name up when you're not in the room and kind of be your cheerleader, uh, pushing you forward into other careers and other positions. So both of those are equally important. And a lot of times a mentor will turn into a sponsor. The other thing is build your brand, build who you are and have a sense of yourself. It's good for your own self-worth, but it's also good for putting out your expertise. And you can build this in a lot of ways. You can build it by commenting on groups on LinkedIn, doing your own blog posts. You can participate in other people's podcasts. You can speak at industry events, whether it's a local event or a non-local event. There's lots of ways that you can do this and, and to get up your folk speaking skills and things like that. But 
as you build your brand, these are accomplishments that you're going to take forward. And we'll talk a little bit about the, the need for those accomplishments later. Now, when we think of ICT careers here in Bixie, we typically think along the lines of the certifications that are offered through Bixie and what some of those do. But I would encourage you to realize that if you're in a job and you don't like it, there's a million other jobs out here. And one of the things that we have noticed throughout the years and, and before COVID, the attrition rate for women in tech was 67%. And that's not women that go find another career. That's women that just flat out leave tech altogether. And we know that's a really unacceptable number. And so we want to encourage people to get involved in these networks and get involved in organizations to help that. Because, you know, these people are your cheerleaders when things go bad. And so from an IT, ICT career standpoint, you know, we think of installers, data center design people, all of this kind of stuff, but think of how this could dovetail. So say for instance, you're an installer and you're working with a certain manufacturer's product. You love that product. You get to know people from that manufacturer and then a sales job opens up with that manufacturer. It's very easy to be able to then slide into that because now you've used your network, you understand that that sales job is open, they know you, you've built your brand with that manufacturer. So that takes a lot off the table of hurdles that you have to jump over. But then think about other things you can do, right? As you get more advanced in the career, in your career, maybe you want to become an educator. Maybe you want to go from doing installations to a career in intelligent buildings or IoT sensors or some of those kind of things. So I encourage you as you move through your career, pay attention to your surroundings and pay attention to all of the manufacturers and all of the customers that you work with, because a lot of times the next job is right around the corner. You just haven't really looked for it. So be mindful and pay attention to what these jobs are and to help you figure out where you want to go. Also think of other things like standards, right? Uh, a, a colleague of mine, she's retired now, Val McGuire made a whole career out of doing nothing but standards. Jonathan Jew, there's a lot of people that are very well known in the standards community. Bixie has standards, IEEE, TIA, ISO, a lot of those touch ICT. You can certainly work in any of those and you don't necessarily have to have a degree to be a representative in the standards if that's something you enjoy. Um, I did that work for a while. I didn't particularly enjoy it, but other people love it. So, you know, to each his own. Data centers, you know, if you start doing work as an installer in a data center, maybe you could go talk to the people that put in the raised floor. If that's something, you know, if you want to be more carpentry-ish or maybe you want to learn more about the networking stack and the server stack and how they sort out because those are things that are interest. Again, you know, sort of look at these side careers and it'll give you some ideas and help spur some thought into things that you might want to do. And then think about other careers on the fringe. You don't just have to be in ICT in one of those certifiable type positions. All of these companies have HR, accounting, back office. You can go take a MOOC. You can figure out some accounting things. Maybe you're a great estimator. You want to be an estimator. Go take some accounting classes. Figure out the bits and pieces you don't know. Take an Excel class. Figure out how to get really good at Excel. Maybe if you know that a company is using a certain software package to do all their estimation, go get certified in that software package and then say, hey, you know, I've done the installation side. I would like to do the takeoff side. And, I, you know, I'd like to move into some of these others. And this is what I've done. Those all become very marketable skills. And then, you know, other things like forklift operators and all of the trades, there's honestly nobody in this in the industry would have a job if it weren't for the trades, because if it wasn't for the trades, nothing would be built. And that's true. Data centers, intelligent buildings, office buildings, you name it, it's all out there. Uh, inside sales, sales management, logistics, code enforcement personnel, you know, government jobs and, and state and city jobs, working with code enforcement and, and fire codes. Uh, think about operations on the operations side, DCIM, operations, ongoing data center management. All of those are things that can dovetail from ICT careers. But invest in yourself. You know, I talked a little bit about MOOCs. They're massive open online courses. And again, college courses that you can go take without the expense or credit of college. But certainly you can list those on your skills. There's a whole bunch of learning on LinkedIn. There's learning here at Bixie, a lot of you know certification classes you can go through. And so look out and figure out what those opportunities are, because if you don't have a degree, you can 100% list these. I'm a firm believer in certifications. I think they're a great way to just immerse yourself into a topic, 
really get command of that topic. And then the certification is your proof that you understand it and you know it because most of them test at the end. So don't, you know, don't downplay certifications. As a matter of fact, a lot of employers will take newcomers that have come in with degrees in something other than whatever that employee, that company does. And the first thing they do is send them out for a certification. Uh, if you happen to be a vet or a spouse of a vet or a child of a vet, uh, companies like Salute Mission Critical have great programs that will train you up and get you into the industry. Um, I work with them a lot too. So if, if you need any introductions there, please let me know. On the job training, you know, it really gets downplayed a lot, but for years before the college systems got so big and there were so many colleges, that's how everybody learned. And still to this day, a lot of unions have OJT and journeyman program and apprenticeship programs to help get you there. We're finding that more and more employers now are starting up their own, uh, excuse me, certification classes and on the job training to get people upskilled or side skilled. Amazon's doing a great job of that. For instance, they're taking warehouse workers and teaching them tech skills. So a lot of those certainly come into play. Manufacturers training, there's an upside and a downside. So one, you are getting schooled in a certain manufacturer's product, but most of that training is applicable to other manufacturers or other pieces of the industry. So for instance, if you get a networking certification from a company that does networking gear, you're still going to learn about networking and that's still going to be applicable to all of those things. Get a mentor or 12 or, you know, whatever number works for you. Make sure that you have the time commitment to be able to put into those relationships. But in a lot of cases, these people might have been in the industry longer than you are around the industry longer. And if you pick out, you know, five things that you love about what you do, five things you hate about what you do, maybe they can pinpoint another career, another avenue for you to go in that really takes advantage of the things that you enjoy. And then figure out what's hot. Do a lot of reading. The, you know, 15 years ago, we didn't talk about intelligent buildings because there weren't really anything. Now that the sensors are growing and, and we do more and more things with sensors and we're getting tighter and tighter integration, there's a ton of things in intelligent buildings. So maybe Maybe an excitement for you is to go work for a company that has the glass that automatically dims when it's really bright outside and opens up when it's the lighting is dim to bring more natural light in. Maybe maybe you want to do occupant sensors. Maybe, you know, pick one. There's a ton of those, all of those manufacturers. An understanding of how those sensors all fit and communicate is another avenue. So um, sustainability is another really good kind of upcoming and ESG projects are also up and coming, um, which is environmental sustainability and governance that kind of is an all encompassing thing. But think about these things, you know, some of these are newer classes, newer certifications, they didn't even exist, you know, just a few short years ago. And the ones that did exist have certainly morphed to be significantly more mature. There's a ton of information out there that you can find about those. But keep in mind, you know, these new, portions of the industry or pieces of the industry, when they become really hot, there's not a lot of people with those skills. So if you do a lot of reading and you kind of get this feeling that something's going to be up and coming, up and coming, and it interests you, invest in it because you might be the you might be the newest expert because there are none, right? Uh, what's that saying in the land of no hats, the man with hat is king or something along those lines. But yeah. So you know think about ways that you can differentiate yourself from other people that you might be competing with in the industry. Uh, as far as networking, you are nothing without your network. I can't stress that enough. And there's lots of places to get involved in a network. Some of those are trade associations. Uh, Bixie is a good one. There's local Bixie chapters. There's AFCOM, 7x24 Exchange, IEEE. There's, you know, all kinds of different trade associations. There's local ones. There's, uh, you know, look around and see. You can do a pretty quick search on trade associations and list your city and you'll find the local ones. I say, you know, if you plan on living in that locality for a while, this can be a really, really good way to find what some of those associations are. Um, it can also clue you into things that are happening in the industry that maybe you didn't know about. So good way. Uh, there is a podcast uh, that I, did, I have done for the last two and a half years called Women, Trades, and Vets in Tech and Data Centers. It's out there if you want some ideas. We interview people in all different walks of life in tech, and they talk about a day in the life, you know, what their challenges are, things that have worked. There's a big section on vets. If any of that's helpful, check it out. 
Infrastructure Masons has um, a digital foundation podcast. It also has some cool stuff. There's lots of them out there. There's podcasting is kind of the new information. So find one that is cool for you and start listening to it and kind of figure out how other people are doing things. Personal networking circles. This could be churches, communities, um, different associations, maybe, maybe even PTA. If you start asking people at the PTA, hey, you know, what kind of stuff do you guys do? That's really where I want to get into. There's all kinds of people that will help. And some of those people will become your mentors. Events are a great way to find out about what's going on, whether that be the national event or certainly local and regional events. You get to talk to different manufacturers, figure out what their stuff does, figure out how all the pieces and parts fit together. All of those are great avenues to develop yourself. And if you find that some of those are really interesting, go take some classes, get certified with that manufacturer. And then not only are you open to jobs with that manufacturer, you're open up to their entire channel and anybody that sells or installs that equipment. And you can certainly look for jobs with those. And again, your mentor might be able to help you. You know, if you can pinpoint some things you like doing, some things you don't like doing, maybe they can help steer you in a career or at least point you in the right direction. And there's all kinds of tests, too, to figure out what your aptitudes are and things that you could be good at. Um, you know, all of those, I think, kind of help formulate your thoughts and take all of those as a piece of the puzzle. Don't take any of them. I, I think at face value is the full puzzle because certainly there's nuances to all of those. Now, as far as mentors and mentees, I think it's really important that if you're going to be in one of these relationships that you know what you want. And I don't mean that you have to know at a granular scale. You don't have to say, hey, this is the exact job I want. I need you to pinpoint how I'm going to get there. But you do have to have some clear idea of kind of things you might like to do. And that will help your mentor guide you and figure out good resources for you, places to learn, um, different different jobs that might be applicable, but not necessarily exactly the same. But the trick is you have to participate, right? Any mentor, mentorship, mentee uh, relationship is going to be iterative it, it, because you're learning new things, right? You're trying new things. So it might be you thought you would like that and then you didn't. And so maybe you figure out that there's pieces of this that you like, but pieces of this that you like. And now maybe your mentor can help guide you in a different career or introduce you to a different mentor that can guide you through that different career. And be open. I, I, I'm, I cannot stress this enough. Right now in this country, things are very divided, sometimes over, you know, some silly things, sometimes over rumors, sometimes over supposition. But diversity and inclusion matter. And you have to be open to viewpoints that don't necessarily equate to your own. And you can't shut people down for having other viewpoints and you can't immediately dismiss everything they have else they have to say because they said something that doesn't agree with your viewpoint. You have to have enough conviction to listen and you might even change your mind. You might not. You might realize that your conviction absolutely matters to you. But for certain things, I think that you have to be open and understanding. And we know if we're going to reach gender parity in tech anytime in my lifetime, hopefully you younger people's lifetime, that we really have to start looking in different ways and we have to be much more open to things that might be outside of our comfort zone. So don't be afraid to play there. I mean, you can you can always ignore what somebody has to say, um, you know, that, that you find not applicable to your life, but don't shut people down because you don't like the first thing they said. The next 10 things might be right up your alley. Like I said, this is going to be an iterative process. So, you know, very, very rarely does it happen that you hit something on the first one and that ends up being the go. And your first mentor is probably not going to be your only mentor. As a matter of fact, I would argue that it should not be. You should probably have multiple mentors as you go through your career, whether it's a formal mentorship or just friends that you sit down with lunch that you can bounce ideas off of and different scenarios off of to get other input. And input is really, really critical. You can't no, no problem is ever solved in a vacuum. And so you have to listen to those other opinions and you have to listen to other viewpoints. And then as you work through this process, in a lot of cases, your mentors become that sponsor. They're the ones that bring your name up when you're not in the room. They're the ones that put your name forward to go speak at an event or do something different. And those people are going to be really critical to your career moving forward. Because if they believe in you, it helps you believe in you, right? 
and it also is definitely going to help with that exposure. Now let's chat a little bit about resumes. There are a lot of tricks that people tell you to use in the industry, and because of the diversity that we talked about on the last slide, I'm going to tell you to ignore some of the advice you get. Like there is advice out in the industry that if you're a woman, you should use your initials. You should absolutely not use your name because people are biased. They're going to see you as your woman and it's going to get you knocked out of the list. How do you build a how do you build diversity if you ignore 50% of the workforce? You cannot. So don't companies that are trying to build that diversity are intentionally seeking out people that fit into some of these other categories. So don't sell yourself short. Don't, don't fall for those tricks. Just be genuine and authentic. There are companies out there that will rewrite your resumes. I made the mistake of hiring one of those years ago. And um, it, it was, I, I really did it so that it would be an ATS format. So I didn't have to figure out what that was. But then they filled it with all these buzzwords that meant nothing, like literally nothing. And so I ended up having to redo all of it and scrap that 1500 bucks. But what you want to do is not use the buzzwords. You want to use keywords. And even if you get somebody to write your resume for you or you peer review it, you have several people give you suggestions and whatever it is for your resume. I want you to say that you are going to have to rewrite that resume multiple times. Because if you're working with an ATS system or an applicant tracking system, they work off of keywords. And it is kind of a downside. So 85% of jobs are filled through networking, 85%. Only 15% of jobs get filled because somebody filled in an application on an ATS. And I will say that companies that use their ATS systems well do a really good job of having a person kind of evaluate a resume because there are a lot of soft skills that are applicable. But that's an art, and a lot of companies are not there yet. A lot of companies don't quite have that. So as you're going through, you want to up your chances of being in that 15% by matching the keywords on your resume to the keywords in the job description, as long as you know that they're legitimately tasks that you can do. If it's something you're working on or willing to take a class in, list that in your cover letter. If it's something that you have a skill that you think is directly translatable, absolutely list that. So a good example, I do a lot of work with, um, like I said, women that are uh, veterans, veteran spouses, and their kids to get them in the industry. And if you take a woman that has been moving around with their military spouse, for instance, and they move every two years, their resume is horrible. And most companies that look at that resume are going to go, mm, this is a job hopper. I'm not really excited. Now, if you put at the top of this, that you are, you know, list your soft skills, very adept to change, um, able to meet new, new challenges um, in a very short period of time, quick learner, massive organization skills, whatever that is, you know, pick out what's going to fit that. List those things in your, as you're talking to um, the person about the job, but as far as the ATS system, you need to figure out what will translate directly to the specific keywords. And there's LinkedIn has a thing now on your resume. Uh, there's, there's a few resume sites that do the same too, where they're pulling keywords. Keep in mind though, those keywords do not mean the same thing from company to company. So make sure you read that job description and make sure that you tailor your resume to that job if you're gonna go the ATS route. Always use peer review. I'm just gonna tell you. Always use peer review. Don't double check your own stuff. I mean, do double check your own stuff, but don't let that be the end all be all. Get some input from other people. Get some input. You know, I've known people that have asked a peer at church, hey, can you, you know, you're in a great job. You do a lot of hiring and firing. Could you just do me a favor and give my resume a once over? And then they got hired. So, you know, peer review could be good for a lot of ways, but it does gut check and it will help point out things because sometimes you get too close to your own career and, and a second pair of eyes is really good. Uh, forget non-essential qualifications if you want the job. And, and so what I mean by that is if you are applying for a management job, don't put responsible for all personnel. That's in the job description. They get that. List things that you did that were sort of outside the box or something that is a good bullet point. So if you're going to list bullet points on your resume, you want it to be things where you could start a sentence, I deserve a raise because, 
and then list whatever that, whatever that is. Those are the bullet points you want. Numbers stand out, results stand out, increase productivity by 20% by implementing a help desk package. You know, those are the kind of things that are tangible that people can point to. And so kind of think along those lines if you're working towards either your cover letter or your resume in, in certain points that you want, think about things that are going to translate that would be a differentiator in that field, not necessarily just, you know, something that goes along with a job description, right? Um, receptionist answered the phone. Well, no kidding. Most receptions do that. That's kind of what they do. So then you want to talk about other things like increased productivity by blah, 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 decreased hold times by blah, blah, blah. You know, those are the kind of things that you want to highlight. Use your cover letters. If you don't have a degree, State that you don't have a degree, but you're willing to work on X. If you've taken a bunch of MOOCs or have a bunch of certifications, highlight those right across the top. Whatever has helped building your brand, highlight that in the cover letter. But think about cover letters this way. You want it to be like the first chapter of the best book you ever wrote. You want something that's going to grab people's attention, hold their attention right off the bat, and be concise because that's what's going to float you to the top. It's not going to be the one that's 700 words. You know, you, you see that now. Somebody sends you a text message and you don't know who they are and they give you 500 things to read. You don't know who they are. Do you read that? Absolutely not. You're not going to read that. So those are the kind of things you want to keep in mind. Forget the artsy stuff. So it's one thing to have a really cute resume. ATS systems are going to ignore that. And most of that cutesy stuff is going to kick it out of the system anyway. If you want to have a really nice professional resume that has maybe a picture in it or some other things, that's fine to take with you on the job, but skip them for the ATS stuff. And if you get too cutesy, then it looks like you're a, a you know, a, a school kid and not somebody serious about their career. So, you know, if you're doing graphic arts, clearly that might be a little bit different, but make sure that you design your resume to the level of the job that you're expecting to get, right? And if you have periods where you're out of the industry or haven't been in the industry, list those. They're going to ask for and you can't really hide them. Um, most ATS systems will kick you out if there's a period in there that from this date to this date where there's no match. Self-improvement, took time out to be a caregiver, whatever that period of time is, it's fine to list that time, but then also list things that you did that built skills, right, during that same period of time. So it might be that you worked with the PTA. So you organized a group of parents for the betterment of children's education. Very realistic sentence, provided you did that. You know, those are the kind of things that help build some of that soft skill to go into your hard skill resume. And then include volunteering and other things that you've done. Now, if your volunteering is protest, you maybe don't, don't want to put that. You know, things that could be particularly controversial, maybe leave those out. But if you are doing volunteering with, you know, a boys club, a girls club, your Girl Scout counselor, all of those things are definitely things that employers look at. And list your professional affiliations too. If you're in a lot of these networking groups, in some cases, they'll reach out to those groups and ask for professional references. So it's always good to have those too. And then as far as career stuff goes, this first one, start today. I want everybody to go home. And when you've done something that's an accomplishment, start a notebook and keep a list of those accomplishment with dates. And it's going to do a few things. One, if you have a really lousy day and you're feeling not so great about yourself, it happens to all of us, you can go back and read those accomplishments and remember the good things that you did that kind of got you on this track. And if you're miserable in your job and you're thinking about going somewhere else or doing something different, then you can go through and look at these and say, hey, you know, I was happy when I did this, 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 and this. Now, let me find jobs that these kind of equate to. And then you can do backwards keyword searches and, you know, find a job with this. And then sometimes the, the internet gods will come back and give you those. Uh, but it'll help you do that. The other thing is when you go to ask for a raise and, the, and your boss says, hey, uh, why do you deserve a raise? You're going to have to be able to list those tangible reasons. And this is where you're going to get those from. Even down the road, as you start building management profiles, for instance, you know, these are all things that are going to be skills that go towards that. And so having this reference to go back on is really good. Because trust me, when you get my age, you're not going to remember all that stuff. When you get half my age, you're not going to remember half that stuff. So do this for yourself. Start it now. Maintain it going forward.
Outreach is really important. Nobody's a mind reader. Nobody's going to know what you want. You have to ask. You have to ask, you know, if, if there's certain things you want in a job, if there's, if you have curiosity about somebody else's job, what, what's a day in the life like? What do you do? Are you, what's this company like to work for? Those are all really critical. Keep in mind, you know, as you're working for your job and, and you're trying to get a job, you need to interview your employer too, because nobody wants to be stuck working for people that are not uh, conducive to a happy life. You could try to separate it all you want, but it, it's really hard to do. And so if you have a bad day at the office, you're not in a great mood when you get home and vice versa. So try to uh, make sure that you ask a lot. So ask for mentorship, ask for ideas, ask for planning, ask, you know, all of those things. And if somebody's in a job that you think you might be interested in, see if you can shadow them for the day, you know, ask those questions. Scour job postings and figure out what the requirements are. If you see a job posting and you think you want to do it, like I said, job postings are different to different companies. Like, you know, pick a job, data center technician. That means something different to everybody. For one company, it might mean that you run all the cable plant in the data center. For another one, it might mean that you do the rack and stack. For another one, it might mean, so look at all of those. Get, get a lot of those different job descri descriptions together and then figure out which pieces of those you already could do or you feel very confident in doing with just a little bit of training and highlight those skills. Redo your keywords each time. That's really, really critical. And then use LinkedIn, other association websites. There are job postings kind of everywhere. Some of them with the associations though, like Bixie, you'll find ones that are more tailored to RCDDs. You might not find as many of those on other sites. And in some cases, companies only post on particular association websites because it's certain certifications that they need or value and they just don't place them other places because they want those to start with. And then look parallel, keep in mind, you know, for one job that you have here, there's probably a thousand other jobs that you're qualified for that are right there in the same room. If you lay cable, Maybe you're not happy doing that job and you like, you know, the carpentry thing and maybe you want to start building cabinets or maybe you want to start doing raised floor or maybe you really get, you know, excited about the HVAC and heat removal and how all that works. Maybe you decide you want to go become an HVAC te technician. All of those things are jobs that are around you. You just have to be open and looking to those as you broaden your horizons. So that's what I have for you today. This is my contact information. I encourage all of you to connect. Um, always, I will connect with anybody pretty much on LinkedIn. So, and if you have questions or comments, I'm always happy to answer those. Just give me, you know, a little time if you need those. And if I don't know the right person, I probably know somebody that does, or at least can do the seven degrees of Kevin Bacon and get you there anyway. Uh, and so are a lot of the other women in Bixie and in all these organizations. There's a lot of folks out there that'll help you. So just don't be afraid to ask. Um, if you are watching this recording, you're clearly not in the live session. So if you do have a Q&A from this recording, please feel free to send it there or on LinkedIn as well. Thanks everybody. I hope you have a great time and I hope you stick around with us at Women in Bixie for more great things to come.